so I, uh, I summarize in the, in the new manner uh, the most important points of uh, yesterday. So uh, it was a question of beginning, how we can begin something in the field of philosophy, but finally more generally. To begin, we have uh, no world, we have no object, uh, we have no being, uh, we have, we have, we have nothing. So, we must begin with nothing. In fact, we have begun with three possibilities, three uh, uh, possibilities of doing something with nothing. First, we have the possibility to give a name to something. So we suppose the existence of language in some time. Certainly we begin with nothing, but not without any language. And a language reduced to the fact that we have the possibility to give a name to something. So we have the possibility to give a name to something, but there is nothing. <coughs> so in some sense, we have the possibility to give a name uh, <coughs> to what? <coughs> but it's the first possibility. We have the possibility to give a name. Second, we have the possibility to begin uh, with nothingness or the void because there is nothing else. So we have a possible beginning, but not in the form of a thing, in the form of nothingness as such. So, in the form of the void, if you want. We are, we are, uh, we are in, in some sense, uh, as God, uh, as a God, uh, at the moment of the creation of the world. <coughs> God has also nothing at all. Probably, if we read the Bible, he has some names too. He name this uh, creature with uh, uh, a name. So, and he has the possibility to uh, do something from nothing. It's uh, the creation ex nihilo, to speak Latin. The creation with... Uh, <coughs> so, uh, you see, there is something in the beginning in philosophy which is near the absolute position of God when God decides to create the world. In fact, the, 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 the question is why God wants absolutely create a world? <coughs> because it's a, it has been a great question of classical philosophy. Because God is an absolute perfection. So, uh, why uh, there is a necessity uh, for him to create something without perfection. It's a, the, the, the question of the desire of God in all uh, this process. What is the desire of God? And the answer, the dialectical answer, is that God is not completely perfect is if does not exist something which is outside this perfection. So it's a dialectical reasoning, a perfect dialectical reasoning. So there is a limit to the power of God if God cannot create something which is non-perfect, which is outside himself. And from the world which is outside himself, God uh, have new possibilities to exercise a, a, his perfection. And so, uh, 
the answer to this question, if uh, there is an answer, we can also say it's a miracle. We know that God creates the world. And we have no, <coughs> there is no necessity to explain this decision. But you, you see that the answer to this very classical question is of dialectical nature. That is, it is a relationship between the perfection and something which is uh, not the perfection, or the relationship between, finally, the infinite and the finite, precisely. And it is impossible, that is, uh, classical and so on, it is impossible for, for the glory of God himself to be alone, <coughs> to be alone. Uh, because the experience of something other, of something else, is a, a very fundamental experience. And if God is alone, finally he is a weak God. A God we cannot be in confrontation, in relationship with something which is of negative nature. We can say also that all that is the idea that God is not complete if God has no experience at all of uh, negativity. If, uh, uh, so the positivity of God is non-complete if God has no experience of negativity. It's true, in fact. With no experience of negativity, there is something which is not completely positive, because the true positivity <laughs> is across negativity. When we have experience of negativity, and we are beyond the experience of negativity. But without the experience of negativity, what is positivity? And so, uh, uh, God creates the world uh, like an experience for himself of negativity. And it is why a very important moment and when creatures uh, are negative, c'est-à-dire a, a creature does not do what would be perfect. And the question of the first scene, <coughs> the original scene, when the negativity appears in fact in the world. At the beginning the world was a sort of paradise without real negativity. It was a, a soft finitude, something like that. But with uh, the, the first scene, the original scene, we have uh, the experience of the negative as such. Something which is not good, which is against the will of God. <coughs> and it's uh, the beginning of uh, the long history of the experience by God of negativity. That is an experience which is a necessity for the potency of God. Without this experience, we have a God which, which is inside the limit of its proper infinity, something like that. You know, all that to say that uh, the philosopher is as God, finally, because we, we must uh, begin by uh, uh, nothingness, Finally, we create something like a new thinking, but this new thinking is only of a positive nature if it contains the experience of negativity. So we return to our proper nothingness. <coughs> and so we, and our proper creation of a, of a world <coughs> with nothing. So we have three possibilities. The possibility to give a name to something. The possibility to take uh, the situation, that is, nothingness or the void, as our beginning. And we have the possibility to take one or different things and to consider that we have a new thing composed of elements. If you want, we have the possibility. This 
this possibility. If we have thing, we have the possibility to put the thing inside uh, that sort of uh, disposition and to say that we have a new thing. This one. It's only with these three possibilities that we structure our beginning. Nothingness, the possibility to give a name, and the possibility to put together the things we are. For the moment, we, are, we have not. But uh, if we have something, we have always the possibility to put them together and to have a, 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 new, a new thing, because this thing is one thing, put together the other, and is different from <coughs> the <coughs> primitive things which exist. Okay, so we, we are uh, in the position to do something, and not in the purely uh, passive uh, position, but with very uh, limited technique. Only give a name, put something together, and the only thing with is, which is precisely nothing. And so uh, we can understand that all that is a, a, a very weak and small construction, which is the construction of something with uh, nothingness. And the most important point is the possibility to give a name, which is, a, in fact, a sort of creative act to give a name, a sort of creative act. It's a, an artistic decision, in some sense. We are the artists of the, of the new world. And certainly, God is fundamentally an artist. <coughs> the artist of the creation of the, the, the world. So, uh, uh, after that, uh, it's the first point. First point, no sickness and three possibilities. So we begin by giving a name to the void. So we use the first and the second possibility. We have the possibility to give a name and we have the possibility to begin with no sickness. So we begin by giving a name to the void. It's practically impossible to say something else with the three possibilities. We cannot do something else practically. So it's a forced decision. It's an obligation. We begin by <coughs> giving a name to the void. So we have a name. And after that, we take this name as the only element of a set. So we use the third possibility. So this is the result of uh, possibility one and two. So the result of the possibility three. And so we have used all our possibilities. Alors, this, uh, this, sort of, uh, um, this sort of thing, which is the name of the void as the only element of a set, it's a singleton. technical name. Singleton is a name of a set which has only one element. And when uh, we do that, we create this singleton and we can give a name to this creation with the first possibility 
And the name is precisely one. Um, here, there is a point which is uh, uh, subtile and, in fact, uh, uh, not really difficult, but which, is, uh, <coughs> which creates some, some trouble in thinking. It's, we, we must absolutely clearly understand that the name of the void and the singleton of the name of the void are different. That this thing and this thing are different. So we create a difference. We create really two different things. Now, we, we, we shall see in a moment uh, more precisely uh, why it's a fundamental concept of difference, which is here, which is something like the creation of difference as such. But the general idea is very simple. The singleton of the void has one element, okay, by definition. But the, 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 the name of the void has no element at all, precisely because it is the name of the void. So we have here the name of nothingness, so something which has no element at all, and we have here something which has one element, this element being precisely the name of the void. So, uh, and we, we must understand, it's not, it's not uh, complex, but it's in some sense subtle, that between something and the singleton of the same thing exists a pure difference. This is a pure difference between the first thing, which are some elements or no elements, or well, and the second thing, which has only one element. Okay. So we can say that, uh, 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 from a philosophical point of view, we are here at the creation of difference, the creation of difference from nothingness. Yeah. In nothingness, there is no difference, precisely. It's a definition of nothingness, that there is no difference in nothingness. There is nothing, so there is no difference. But if we have no difference in nothingness, we create difference by cre the creation of the name for nothingness, and after that, the singleton of nothingness, without anything, in some sense. Without anything. And in a more, in a simpler language, we can say that this first absolute difference is the difference between zero and one. Because zero is the name of uh, the name of the void and the, <coughs> the name of one. So it's the difference of zero and one. Or as you know, the difference between zero and one is inside all the world of artificial images today. <coughs> because all electronic images are made of zero and one. Because the point of uh, an images, uh, <coughs> electronic images, is determined by a real number, but the real number which is written with uh, zero and one. And so, uh, in some sense, the difference between zero and one is the difference, the possibility to compose what you want only with this difference, by repetition, use, combination, and so on, of this difference. And you, you know why? because the difference between one and zero can be the, the difference between uh, 
uh, there is a sig uh, signal or is it no signal. Yeah. And uh, there is electric signal, but there is stopping of electric signal. One, zero. And with that, you do what you want. You do the most complex images of the most enormous uh, film. <coughs> So, in some sense, our world, uh, our, our, the part of our world which is immaterial, the part of our world which is immaterial, which is so uh, technologically important, all our images, all our communications, uh, uh, ephod and so on, all that, which is a so important part of contemporaneity, all that is the projection of the first difference. The difference between something and the singleton of something, which is a difference, finally, between zero and one. And so uh, it's not at all a uh, uh, secondary point, the point where we are here. It's, a, it's really something like a, a, a very contract and small representation of a, a large part of our cultural and mental world today. The play, the infinite play between zero and one. That is the infinite play of pure difference. Pure difference. Because you see, between it's a play of pure difference between, between uh, this sign and this sign. In some sense, there is no thing. It's the same material. It's the same thing as such here and as one here. But it's a difference between the same and the same in some sense. It's what? It's a pure difference. Or if you want, it's the minimal difference. But the minimal difference is the paradigm for all differences. And we have today a technological proof of that. That is the possibility to create the image of what you want only with the pure difference between zero and one. That is finally between the name of the void and the singleton of the name of the void of the void. Donc in some sense with the void. With the void which is between zero and one. <coughs> the void which is just the separation between zero and one. So the pure difference. Alors three we introduce a new operation, the succession. And the succession is a, a, a derived operation, a new operation that we can have from the, the, that we had before, the succession of something is element of x plus x itself. It is why it's a true succession. That is something plus one thing which is the name of uh, the elements of x. So the operation consists to put the name of the thing inside the thing. I repeat what I said yesterday. And it's a succession because we pass from something to something else without any external thing. It's not an adjunction, it's not an addition. It's a something and the name of something. Exactly as we can see that 
the successor of the void is the singleton of the void. The only difference is that the void has no elements at all, so there is only x itself. You cannot take elements of the void because the void has no elements. So, our operation of succession is only the generalization of the first difference between the void and the singleton of the void. We can, we can do here an objection, uh, eventually. <coughs> I say that this, this part is different from X, that the successor of X is not reducible to X. There is a condition that the name of X is not an element of X. Now, if the name, see, if x itself is an element of x, when we do the element of x, we have x itself, and so we have no change at all. The successor of x is x. Okay, you understand the point. You know, as the x, we take all what is in x and the name of x, and we have one element. Uh, more. But if the name of X is in <coughs> the element of X, if the name of X is here, when we take the successor of X, we take the element of X and no more because X itself is in the element of X. So we affirm, it's a new principle, we affirm that the name of something is always external to the elements of these things. So the name of something is not inside the thing. The name comes from the exterior. And it's true. It's true. <coughs> our name is not decided by ourselves. <coughs> our proper name comes from, from parents, from the society, uh, from them. The name is not inside the baby. <coughs> the name, the, the poor baby, uh, <coughs> don't decide his name. He's, and uh, sometimes uh, when he understands that he has the name, he is not so glad. <coughs> and he changes the name. But the change of name is always something which comes outside because the change of name is the name at the place of another name which comes from outside. And the place is outside. And we must go to the, uh, to the state uh, and to the bureaucratic state to say my name is not this name, it's another name, and to do papers and so on and so on. So it's a purely exterior affair. And so the, this point is of a great metaphysical importance. Uh, it, uh, um, that the name of something cannot be inside the thing. We have a, a pure experience of all that. You, you know that we, when we see that this is a glass, we know that glass has no uh, close relationship uh, with the, the thing. It's not in, inside the glass. We certainly don't find the word glass. And it is why uh, we can do glass, but if I am in my uh, native language, I say, c'est un verre, <coughs> and, and, and so on. So, it's uh, the, the great idea of the, uh, the arbitrary of nomination. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, the nomination is uh, not necessary. There is no necessity of the nomination, precisely because the name is not inside the thing. If the name is inside the thing, I put the name inside the thing. It's not possible. But if the name is outside the thing, the name of a set is in fact outside the set. And so when we take the successor, we have the elements of the 
the set X and X, which is the name of the set itself, and the name is not in element of it. So we have really, with the successor, the element of X and one more, the name. And, 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 and it is why we, we are all successors, <laughs> because our name is, uh, we have the name, but the name is not, uh, is, is a composition of ourselves, but not inside our proper existence. So we have something like uh, possible successors of ourselves. When we, we say my name, Yes, but my name is not exactly my name. My name is something which is outside what I am. When I, uh, when I reduce myself to me and my name, I say that I am my proper successor, successor of myself. But it's not really possible to be the successor of ourselves. So finally, we have a paradox of nomination. And it is why the relationship to the human subject, to the name, is always a true problem, true problem, because across the name we have the world finally, not only the parents but the parents before the parents uh, and so on, and, and the, the decision, and at a moment, at, a, at an historical moment, we have some uh, <coughs> some surname which are uh, in the wind, so. Many, many girls uh, have the name uh, Monica, <coughs> and, and, and this is a purely historical. They don't decide this thing concerning all that. And so uh, the correlation between uh, the complex nature of a subject and the name, which is always something like the reduction of somebody to a single term. <coughs> Our name is always something which put what we are in the form of a single term. And uh, <coughs> we can always say, it's not me. <coughs> it's not me. I am much more complex than all that. I am much more, <coughs> I am not reducible to my name. I okay. my, my, my brother, which is a, an horrible man, has the same word, name, <laughs> so on. It's a discussion, the discussion with the name, it's a, a very difficult discussion with the name. We are here too. We are at the abstract form of all that, which is the creation of something by the name, and after that, the reduction of the name itself to a single term. It is, uh, the, uh, this one, the singleton is something like uh, the identity document. <coughs> the identity document of the void, finally. A paper where there is your name, your date of birth, and so on. Your singleton. <coughs> you, uh, in a bureaucratic form, uh, reduced to uh, something like a written paper, a small written paper. It's you. Identity. It's your identity. But his identity can be reduced to a single tone. We, 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 we perfectly know that it is impossible. <coughs> so it's a, <coughs> all, all, all the problem of identity, documentation concerning identity, relationship between pure identity and the complexity of some body, the body and the soul and so on and, uh, and all that. Uh, it, it, ah, ah, that sort of problem, the final is a problem of succession. Problem of succession. So, uh, uh, and it's the uh, last point, we have the possible succession, the series, the series like that. And the point of the most interesting, we, we, we have a mixture of uh, 
repetition and creation, repetition and novelty. Repetition because they say which is zero, one, two, and so on. Repetition because we have the same operation, the succession, once, twice, three times, four times, and so on. So we have the repetition of the same operation, but all terms, the result of this repetition is different, completely different terms. And so uh, the, the, the series is a dialectical series because there is two contradictory dimensions. On one side, it's a pure repetition, pure process of continuation. On the other side, it's the creation of completely new and different terms. And so, we, you know, we have created from nothingness with very few means, very few uh, instruments. We have created the difference, the difference between uh, zero and one, so the pure difference, the fundamental difference, and also the repetition. The repetition because we have finally to create this difference, to repeat the same operation. Oh, it's a, an abstract image too of our world. And it is why the question of uh, immaterial images and so on is so important today. Because uh, uh, the, the relationship between repetition and difference, repetition of an operation and pure difference is really something which is reflected in the money, in the money, the circulation of the money. Because you know there is a, naturally a, a very uh, strong relationship between money and number. <coughs> money is always a numerical evaluation of something. So our world is a projection, an abstract projection of all what exists in the universe of numbers by the mediation of a price. All are the price. And the price, what is the price? The price is precisely the relationship between one thing and the abstract place of numbers. So, uh, uh, three dollars. <coughs> it's a relationship between any uh, concrete uh, uh, and, 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 and this and this scheme. Yeah. And so uh, uh, <coughs> our world where all that is practically complete, yeah, where practically all what exists as a price, yeah. not only the objects, but for example, uh, our labor as a price. We, <laughs> we, we have money at the end. So human beings too have a price, not only things. It's a fundamental dimension of uh, our situation. And uh, uh, finally, and, and all man and all woman has also a price. By the, they are retired, and the question, the discussion, of how many, how many we pay uh, an old person? It's a fundamental problem today. You know that. <laughs> and so, in the practically the, the totality of the world, we have a constant projection of what exists on the surface, the flat surface of numbers. 
Or, the flat surface of numbers is a composition of repetition and pure difference. Zero, one, succession and repetition. And so, maybe, progressively, the world is reduced to something like that. Not only the world of images, but the real world, which becomes like an image of itself across the body. And so uh, it's uh, the, uh, this, uh, this uh, vision explains why the question of uh, images is so important today. Everybody says today we have images, we have communications, we have uh, and so on. That is, we have uh, zero and one. <coughs> and finally, we have Monet. But Monet is a point where all what exists, images, uh, uh, human beings, uh, life of uh, all persons, and so on and so on, all that is projected uh, on the surface of Monet, that is, uh, sur uh, on the surface of, uh, of the composition of repetition and pure difference. And so the question of the price is fundamental. Because the price is uh, the operation of uh, the projection, the price of something. And it is why all big crises of our world is a crisis of this phenomenon. That is, the crisis of the price, the crisis of the money. the brutal possibilities of uh, complete uh, pathologic determination of prices. And so finally, the possibility of our many things without price. <laughs> without price because nobody can have these things because the price is too low because they have no money at all. You know the beginning of all that uh, some years ago, <coughs> but it's continue, continue. <coughs> but what is, uh, from a philosophical point of view, what is, uh, what is that sort of crisis? Naturally, it's the economic crisis, crisis of capitalism, and so on. But it's fundamentally a crisis of the relationship between concrete existence and uh, the surface of numbers. The crisis of the possibility to affirm that everything has a price. And the point, which is inside our question from the beginning, is that a price is always a finite price. An infinite price is a nonsense because nobody can have infinite money. <coughs> you know some person have a lot of money <coughs> and sometimes a big lot of money, but not, in, but not at the infinite. <coughs> so the money as such is inside the realm of the finite, absolutely. So when we say that all what exists has a price, you are saying that all what exists is finite. It's a, and, and so capitalism is also a philosophy. The philosophy which affirms that everything, all what exists, the human life itself is finite. And the idea behind is that we can buy somebody, somebody, a person, a subject, as certainly a price. 
the idea that the, uh, that the subject has a price is a fundamental idea of corruption. <coughs> so corruption, corruption is a philosophical concept and not only a concept for uh, people, newspapers. <coughs> Corruption is a necessity inside our world because, it, because it's an inevitable consequence of the idea that uh, all what exists has a price. If all what exists has a price, the subject too has a price <coughs> in principle and so uh, I can buy the will of the subject. <coughs> You know, and so uh, the true definition of corruption is that corruption is a consequence of the global projection of all what exists on the surface of the market. The projection of all what exists on the surface of the market, that is the surface of the money. And you, you, you must observe that this projection is also a complete affirmation of the radical finitude of the world, of the subject, of what we do, of the human life, and so on. If all what exists has a price, all is finite. And it is the key of the return to classicism. <coughs> if classicism is precisely the affirmation of finitude of human life, And we have the same consequence, that is, to desire something infinite is a disaster, is hubris. <coughs> And I have said uh, <laughs> before that, but I repeat, because it, it is the, the true content of uh, the contemporary uh, fight against, finally, ideas, great ideas, great projects, great visions. Because all that is the symbol of the desire for the infinite. And the desire for in the infinite cannot have a price. The desire for the infinite cannot have a price. If somebody has really in many possible uh, uh, activities the desire for the infinite, we, it, it's impossible to corrupt him because the desire for the infinite certainly has no price. You know, if you have a desire for the infinite and if somebody says, what is your price? <coughs> you, you must have an, an answer. My price is infinite. <coughs> but if your price is infinite, you are not corruptible. <coughs> because the corruption begins when you have a price. <coughs> that is a finite price. And, you know, it's a... Con 
mais les concrete situation, not at all abstraction. Our world is the world of corruption. It's not a judgment, it's by necessity the world of corruption. If all, because because uh, it's a world which is a projection uh, of all what concretely exists on the surface of succession and pure difference. That is the surface of the money of the market. And so what is of real interest in this world? It is to find something which has no price at all. Something without price. It's an expression of the language, without price. Quelque chose qui est sans prix in French. Sans prix, without price. That is the, the most magnificent thing, the most important thing. The, the, my life is without price. My love is without price. What we want. But to, but to find something which is without price is to find something which is, in some sense, outside the dominant world. Because the dominant world is a world where all what exists has a price. And it is why we can define philosophy, if philosophy is something interesting, <coughs> by to find new means, to create a new means, new subjective and intellectual means, to search in the world what is without price. <coughs> I think it's a good definition of philosophy. <coughs> a good definition of philosophy. To, to, to create to new, new means, if it, if it is possible, to, to find in the world what is without price. And uh, for the very beginning, uh, philosophy names what is without price an idea. It was the name of for Plato, an idea. We can change the world, but it's a true uh, definition. In some sense, in our world, to search something which is without price is not easy, is not clear. Because a thing without price is a thing which, from the point of view of the dominant world, is outside the world. Because precisely in the world, all what exists has a price. So if something has no price, it's something outside the world. And it is why, when we really desire find something which is without price, that is something infinite. That's something infinite. We return to the point. <coughs> when we, we, we search something like that, we must finally have a new vision of the world itself. Because in the world as it is, we cannot find something like that. Or it's very, very difficult. When we, it, it's very difficult in, in the creative uh, activity itself. You know, you, you, you search something infinite uh, in the world of painting, in the world of artistic creation, uh, in the world of a uh, new form of uh, images in cinema and so on, uh, or in the field of mathematics. And, or uh, by uh, a new invention in the field of politics. But uh, uh, the reduction of all that to something which has a price is constant. There is naturally a market for new paintings uh, and so on. We perfectly know all that. So what is the proof that something has no price? <coughs> 
because very often maybe maybe something has no price but there exists a price for the same thing that is our problem all is in the market in some sense so uh, you 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 create something absolutely new uh, and uh, two years uh, after uh, uh, this thing has a uh, extraordinary price and you 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 become a rich rich man <laughs> you you become a rich man because you have searched something without price <coughs> But uh, with the market, the object with the price has a price and so on. You know the, the, the complexity of all that. And it is why, I think, uh, the only possibility is to affirm that we must change the world itself. And not only uh, find for our personal <coughs> uh, emancipation, for our personal freedom to search uh, something without price. You know, the question of the price is the question of the world. And something without price is outside the world, or if it is inside the world, it has a price, finally. And so uh, uh, we, we must imagine uh, a, a, a change of the rule itself. The rule of the world. That is the rule of corruption. The rule of corruption. Because this world cannot be pure. <laughs> this world can, cannot be pure. The corruption is in the law of the world itself. There exists uh, many. Uh, perfectly honest uh, men and women. <laughs> it's not the problem. The corruption is the, is the rule of the world. Another question. And uh, it is why uh, we, we, we must return to our problem. Uh, if the law of our world is the projection of all what exists, on the surface of numbers. So, if the law of the world is to affirm that uh, everything has a price, and you know now, uh, water has a price, uh, maybe uh, <coughs> the sky has a price, uh, <coughs> the sun has a price, <coughs> our existence has a price, or wealth has a very enormous price, and so on. Every day, something new has a price. <coughs> so if the rule is that uh, everything has a price, uh, all that affirms, metaphysically, that uh, all what exists is finite. It is we return to our question. And the search for something without price is a search for something infinite in a world where all is finite. That is why it is so difficult. It's to do something infinite with something which uh, is finite in some sense. So probably, uh, with one on, of our four choices, <coughs> along the line of one of our four choices, we, we, we must affirm that the only possible way is to an attempt to change the rule itself. Change the rule itself, and that is it. That to affirm that it is false that all is finite, that all what exists is finite, and that the world contains many things which are without price, 
and we must be without pies. And so, uh, uh, it is why uh, we must return beyond uh, our explanation of the surface of the finite, how we can construct and think the realm of uh, the infinite, the realm of infinity, as something which uh, must be also exposed to the existence of the world. And our beginning in this way was the search with the finite, inside the finite, or beyond the finite, or something the name of which was Omega. Omega being something like the first infinite that uh, we can uh, observe and define inside, just after, inside and just after the realm of the finite. And so, uh, it's possible to say that uh, in our concrete life, the point is to find Omega. <laughs> the, the, most simple ethical rule, <coughs> find omega. <coughs> find omega, that is, find the point where we uh, must affirm uh, that uh, the infinite uh, exists really in uh, new dialectics to the finite, with the finite. Yes, there is many variations. Uh, the imperative, be find in, uh, it, in the existence the thing without price. Find a new relationship between finitude and the infinite. Don't be reducible to succession and pure difference. <coughs> More abstract form. <coughs> Don't accept corruption. Negative form. It's not so easy. Don't accept corruption. Because uh, I propose a very large definition of corruption. <coughs> It's not only to, to have millions uh, under the table. <coughs> yeah. Corruption is precisely to accept the idea that uh, everything has, has a price, finally. To, to be subjectively in the conviction that uh, finally what, all what exists has a price. It's, uh, corruption is, is corruption by money at the end. But in fact, it's First, corruption by the idea of money. That is, there is a, a, a subjective corruption which is the very beginning of corruption. After that, uh, uh, we have uh, effectively uh, uh, millions under the table, corruption with uh, uh, the market of the arms, of the drugs, and so on. And, all that we know perfectly in newspaper and so on, but nobody explained that, okay, uh, this big corruption is uh, uh, terrible and so on, but that where is the possibility, the radical possibility of corruption in a world where we affirm that finally everything has a price? And the corruption begins by the acceptation of uh, this point of view. And the idea that Hey, we, okay, uh, all what exists as a price, and so my, 
my work has a price, and it's true. My work has a price. So uh, the point is not to see that my work has a price, because it's a reality. We cannot negate this point, but to accept that finally we cannot do anything else. And so to accept profoundly and definitively that, okay, uh, a world where everything at the price is not a good world, but it's the world. It's a small beginning of the corruption. And, and, and so, you know, uh, it's, it's always without many consequences to accept the idea that the world is as it is. It's a paradox. After all, it's true that the world is as it is. <laughs> Nothing is more true than it's a, something like, uh, it's a, like a joke. It, it, but it's not really the case. You must assume a subjective position which does not accept that the world is as it is. <coughs> the fact that the world is as it is is not an argument. <coughs> it's not an argument. Okay, uh, many things are, are they are and they are bad, after all. <coughs> Something uh, which is not a good thing exists. And, it's a, uh, and, and so we, we have a, uh, an obligation of a subjective determination to be in the world. And so my work has a price, uh, my house has a price, uh, uh, and so on. It's true. And we cannot escape, suddenly, that sort of reality. We, we live in a world where everything has a price. But there is different manners to live in that sort of world. There is different manners. And not only one manner, which is pure acceptation of all that. Because we, we must know that this acceptation, this uh, absence of negative and critical will, is the beginning of corruption. And what we can name, and its name, uh, Passive corruption, passive corruption. Active corruption is to, to, to pay millions under the table, to, <coughs> to have something, uh, to organize uh, a mafia, and so on. But passive corruption is a subjective determination. We can be passively corrupt without uh, any money. <coughs> a poor can be corrupted, not because he has money, he's poor, but because he is completely convinced that the law of the world is the price. And so uh, we, we, we must really uh, being in search of something like Omega. Omega, the negation of Omega being the corruption itself. Okay, and so we have uh, uh, represented Omega as not the singleton, but at the opposite side, but the putting together all finite numbers.
affirme without any uh, complete understanding of uh, what we affirm here that maybe can exist something which is beyond the realm of uh, finite because uh, it is a, a, a complete recollection of all the finite and so something which is not inside uh, uh, the succession or inside or reducible to uh, the pure difference. The idea maybe it's that omega is completely outside the succession. Certainly, it cannot be produced by succession. We have said that there is no x which is just before omega. <coughs> non exist x with omega identical to the successor of x. That is, omega does not succeed. Omega is radically beyond the first sequence of succession. But the rule of succession can be extended to omega. That is the point. Omega does not succeed, but maybe there exists a successor of omega. That's another problem. There is no x before omega, but is there something which is just after omega? Why not? Why not? Because, after all, If we search the successor of omega, we can apply the definition and we have first all elements of omega and omega itself. Okay. So there is no rational objection to the existence of a successor for omega. We put the complete succession of uh, uh, numbers and the name of this succession, that is omega, it is exactly the same uh, mechanism that the construction of the succession in general. And so, we have the situation where omega, the first infinite, is in fact between two successions. We can represent all that like that. We have the first succession, <coughs> the finite, all that is omega, and we have the second succession, Because, you know, omega does not succeed, but it's absolutely possible to have something which succeeds to omega. And so omega is between two successions.
So the point is that if we affirm the possible existence of the first infinite omega, you really open a new world in the form of a new succession. This new world is in the infinite. Because if omega is infinite, certainly omega, the successor of omega is infinite too. We cannot re return to the finite by an addition. So we open a new infinite world. Omega being the mediation between the first world, which is the finite world, and this second world, which is a world opened by Omega itself. So Omega is between two worlds between two worlds. And in fact, when we find something infinite, something without path, it's always the opening of a new world. It cannot be only a point. If it's only a point, certainly we return to uh, the price and the finite. If you have, for example, a big idea, a big artistic idea. An artistic idea which is clearly beyond the finite realization of the day, beyond the market and so on. Certainly the actualization of this idea will be the beginning of something. The beginning of a new sequence of artistic creation, the beginning of a new form of the world and so on. There is not only one work isolated in the sky. When we find something infinite, we find a new world. In fact. Maybe the most uh, simple example, example is romantic love. <coughs> it's romantic love. When we, we have, uh, when we are really uh, in uh, love with its proper intensity, we perfectly know that uh, it's not uh, you know, one uh, sexual night, but uh, certainly the opening of a new world, the new world which is not the world of the one, but the world of the two, something like that, which is infinite in this sense, in the sense which is uh, the opening of something radically new and something which is without price. It's very difficult to buy a law. <coughs> not a possibility. Uh, love sometimes is corrupted by itself, inside itself. Another story. But love as such, we know it, uh, it, we, cannot, we cannot give a price. So it's infinite in this sense. But also it's uh, really like Omega. So it, there is a, the world before the, the love encounter and the love after the love encounter. And actually, you return in some sense to succession. But it's not succession as pure finite existence, but succession in the infinite for a moment. For a moment. <coughs> and you know, uh, uh, it is why the, the abstract vision is useful, because he, he, the abstract vision shows really why when we find a point, which is a point uh, beyond the repetition, something new, if you want, it's uh, really, by necessity, the opening of a new world, and not only a single point in the succession. If the point is not in the succession, like Omega, we have the succession of the point itself. And that is the creation of a new world, and we can see that is an infinite world. Alors we can say, but after that, <coughs> at the end of the new sequence, but at the end of the new sequence, 
we have a new infinite point. We have a new infinite point, which is, the name is omega kappa. And after this point, we have another, and so on. So the opening of a new world is also the promise of the possible opening of different new worlds. It's uh, an example for everybody, the opening of a new world, and the possibility to escape corruption. So the possibility for infinite successive creations of new infinite worlds. It's a promise of something like that. It's a promise which is a rational promise. So to, to clearly understand all that and to have a completely uh, clear vision of the world of infinite, we, 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 we must uh, give some other definitions, which are, as you can see, uh, not purely uh, mathematical. The mathematics is only the skeleton of the idea. But uh, as you see, the idea is uh, the idea of capitalism, uh, the idea of uh, price, the idea of uh, the market of painting, uh, the idea of love, and so on. So it's not at all to do mathematics. Mathematics are not of interest for us, but mathematics here, a big, small part of mathematics, give us really new means to understand the true situation, which is our subjective situation. And so it is why you have a paper. I don't know if I have the paper myself. Yes, I have. I have. Just before uh, the interruption, just before the interruption, some words concerning the paper. Uh, it's only uh, you 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 can uh, see that uh, only exactly as a, a skeleton, exactly like like a, a purely uh, abstract uh, form of something which is, uh, uh, after all, uh, completely uh, concrete. Alors, you are uh, uh, two parts, as you see, in the paper, which is the first, maybe I give you another, uh, I don't know when. <coughs> <coughs> There is two, two parts. First, uh, just uh, 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 explication of some symbols. And as, uh, as we know, uh, The decision concerning a symbol uh, is a arbitrary one. It's, a, it's to, to, to can read uh, the su successive formula. And after that uh, formula, uh, different formula from key, which are going from the simple to the more complex. The goal, which is contained in the last formula, is to give you uh, 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 a precise definition of what is uh, the difference between two infinite. Because our goal, our most fundamental goal, is to explain that we can, in fact, replace the whole opposition between the finite and the infinite by a more interesting difference, which is the difference between two different infinites. That we are not enclosed in the difference between finite and the infinite, between our world and another world, because we can and have a clear vision of the difference inside the infinite itself, okay? And uh, 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 naturally, uh, we have something like an intuition of the difference between finite and the infinite. 
uh, an intuition which is not so good after all, but we have an intuition. The finite is small, the infinite is very big, and, and something like that. Well, the, the, the finite is our world, and the infinite is a transcendent world. But we have no real intuition concerning the difference inside the infinite itself. Or if we uh, want uh, escape the corruption, that is, escape the conviction that finally the infinite is only a sort of horizon, something which is abstract, something which is outside the world, and that in our world the fact is that all what exists has a price. If we want to escape this uh, vision, uh, we must not only affirm the existence, the po positive existence of the infinite, but also affirm that there is a multiplicity of different infinities. But to understand the different multiplicities, the multiplicity of different infinities, we have first no clear intuition, neither good nor bad. So we must construct the idea, and after that we have intuition. But we must construct first the idea. It is why at the end of the paper we have uh, the formula for the cardinality of a set, that is the possibility to define the uh, type of infinity. Uh, to, to, to take a multiplicity and to say this multiplicity is a small infinite, a big infinite, and so on. So to have a clear idea of differences inside infinity itself. That is the goal and is not too complex. Don't be afraid. That is my <laughs> last my last affirmation. Don't be afraid. It's not really complex. And if it is complex, you say to me. That's right. But it's a it's a I insist it's not at all to uh, to do mathematics uh, uh, as an exercise. It's really like the construction of a road to understand something new, to really understand something new. And you know, the idea of the infinite is generally uh, not clear. It's an, our intuition of the infinite is obscure. And uh, sometimes the direction of religion, but uh, when uh, the idea is not in the direction of religion, it's really an obscure idea. Or, from during the, the last century, practically, uh, mathematicians, in fact, have proposed a completely new idea of the infinite, which is a clear idea, which is not an obscure one. And so it's not good that philosophy uh, will be completely separated of this proposition concerning the infinite, because the infinite after all, is a very important philosophical idea. It is why don't be afraid is only the construction of an escalator. <coughs> <Okay. coughs> <Okay. coughs>